Okay, uh, good morning folks. This will be a short pugilism video or shorter um, because it's not going to involve me putting on the gloves or anything. What I want to talk about is uh, orthodoxy versus uh, the unorthodox, all, basically all the rest uh, of the different styles and stances. Uh, and in general, the difference between being a defensive fighter uh, or a counter fighter being an offensive uh, fighter or even an offensive counter fighter. So, if you know how to play chess, then you're aware of, if you really know how to play chess, of the value of pawns. Most people throw away their pawns. They're the kind of person that uh, sees them as uh, pointless and useless. That would be akin uh, in boxing to being still of the mental maturity to where you're thinking, whatever I'm going to do when I step onto the mat or into the ring is going to happen. That's not really how that always goes. In fact, the obsession with thinking this is what I'm going to do is one of the most dangerous obsessions that, that uh, you can have. It's, it's, it's a very uh, egocentric and, uh, um, frankly, naive uh, way of approaching the battle, whether it's a self-defense battle or a competition. And the reason is because every conflict like that is a relationship. Right? There's a touch and go. There's a push and pull. And there is going to be a reciprocal behavior. Uh, one of the principles in the art of war is whatever you're planning, they're probably planning something really similar. Uh, because if you're thinking of taking over their castle, they're probably thinking of taking over your castle. And chess exemplifies that. Now, the person who really understands how to use pawns sees that they have multiple layers of use, right? They, they can be used to dissuade, they can be used to threaten. They can be used to sacrifice, they can be used to create walls and fortifications. And the equivalent of that in boxing is that you, your striking uh, arts can be used as a defense, right? A good, a good well-placed jab will keep somebody at a certain space. Uh, and also, even when you block, that is, it's not dissuasive of a, of a strike, right? They, they will hit the, hit the blocks just to try and fluster you, wear you down, but at least you know uh, how to help them aim for something, right? So if you're blocking up high, you can figure that after they hit the arms a couple times, what they're going to try and do is go around you or go below the blocks. If you know that, then you can bait them in. <clears throat> when you talk about the orthodoxy, and I mentioned this in the uh, first, very first video, uh, the pugilism zero, Orthodoxy tends to be more defensive in boxing, in Western boxing. And the reason is, is because we want to build ourselves into a situation where we can use classic moves, uh, refined technique that is very, uh, it's, it, it's timeless because it works. And we want to use those at exactly the right time. And the best way to do that is to have an excellent pawn game. And to, to do that, you combine a bit of defense, a bit of counter, in order to draw the person in and also slowly wear them down. And that's why, classically, you need to be able to go 12, 15 rounds straight, throwing punches and taking hits, in order to make that orthodox game go. Now, don't get me wrong, there are a lot of Western boxers who hate that style, who they personally, they can't do the Floyd Mayweather uh, style. They just, they're not going to do it. Um, they're, and even if they, they can go that long, like Tyson Fury, uh, they still prefer some type of unorthodoxy. And why is that? Because it unbalances the opponent. This would be like adding uh, knights and or bishops into your pawn work, working them all together to where they're not separate things, but that they're working together. So your blocks, your jabs, your crosses... Uh, and controlling the spacing, the angle, and the timing, all of that works together so that later on your power pieces can come into play. And again, if your rooks and queens and everything are here represented by your uh, like long hooks and or haymakers, your overhands, your shovel hooks, um, any kind of liver shots, anything that uh, gives you uh, an extreme edge. And then in terms of how to move unorthodox, uh, all the any kind of leaning, dipping, things that aren't just normal slipping, but you know, actually changing and leaning, 
uh, going backward, um, slipping the jab actively, right? So there's a difference where you slip the jab because you know it's coming because everybody's doing the same uh, series of combos and then slipping the jab because they really think that they're about to tag you because they're thinking about how I'm going to accomplish this and you slipping the jab so that you can come in and get that shovel hook uh, and bury it into the kidney area. That is a, an or, unorthodox way of looking at the fight. And then when you get into Kung Fu, um, there's an even bigger emphasis on uh, being offensive and on uh, the unorthodox because you want to be able to do things like hit them in the eye with uh, certain uh, dots and I'll show the how to on some on some of those later on in a more advanced video but I just want you to think about for right now what it means to be orthodox versus unorthodox because there is an assumption in Western boxing that if you are a classic orthodox boxer you will always win and that's not necessarily true and there's an assumption among street fighters and, uh, let's say, mixed martial artists that if you are an a, uh, unorthodox style fighter that you'll always win. And that's not true. Sometimes orthodoxy overcomes unorthodoxy and sometimes unorthodoxy overcomes orthodoxy. You have to look at the rules that are contained in the art of war. He who controls the terrain, which is not about up and down, but there is a momentum that happens in the board, just the same as there's in chess. Chess is also a flat board, but there's an energy surge and there's energy vacuums, there's energy wells, right? And in the ring you have, uh, and in the octagon too, you have corners, you have barriers, and all of those things have a subtle effect on the subconscious mind, plus there's the entire uh, surroundings. Now, if you don't have those things, if it's a street fight, think about uh, cars and curbs and chairs and tables. Those all have a subtle effect on the, on the conscious mind, and if you can use that, you can really overcome quite a bit. Uh, I was doing, this is separate, but I was doing a, f a fencing match and we were doing two on one. This guy was pretty good, but he wasn't following the rules that had been set for by the instructor. Uh, and he was uh, whacking at full speed instead of using the Tai Chi technique. So I started to use the control of terrain and backing him in until finally he stumbled over uh, a, big, a big rock, but he didn't see it. Why? Because he was so obsessed with um, with being able to control against two people by whacking it at hands. And credit to him, I mean, he's, he's very, very uh, talented, but I still backed him over a rock. Why? Because I controlled the spacing and the angle, and, uh, I, and could, I controlled the pressure. And pressure is really, really important in survival. You have to be able to put on the pressure and pull off the pressure. If you over-apply pressure really early on, you can waste a lot of energy, and just tear, tire yourself out. And a really good boxer is going to draw that energy out of you by by directing that pressure. But they direct the pressure out of you and then away, right? To always to one side or the other. And you think of some of the most excellent boxers that have ever lived. But uh, I personally think right now the person to study from is Lomachenko. He is the epitome of what a uh, a Western boxer who has achieved gong fu in the ring, warrior skill is supposed to be able to do. He has all the orthodoxy and all the unorthodoxy. It's like bobbles in his hand. He can do whatever he wants. And there's really no one that can stop him. I personally think he could win in the heavyweight division just by, you know, flurries of punches. Uh, obviously, his shoulder has to be all the way healed up. But it's amazing to watch. And it is a, it's an art as much as a science, but the science has to be there. And if, without the science of understanding pawn work, of creating the spacing and the angles by using the jabs and the blocks, then your then your orthodoxy will be weak. And in my opinion, you cannot have a good unorthodox style without orthodoxy. You can have a sloppy unorthodox style. There are plenty of there have been plenty of people who are unorthodox fighters who are very very sloppy. But if you want to be a Muhammad Ali type uh, unorthodox, where you uh, or Sugar Ray Leonard, where you just defy gravity, it seems like. And the only way is to totally master the orthodoxy. And then once you know the orthodoxy, you know all of its limits. You know every, everything about the system that everyone's learned. And when you learn it, then you can modify. It's like playing with the matrix code. You can change it to whatever you want it to be. And that's where Lomachenko is. And that's why I think it's worth watching. So I'm going to link uh, some highlight videos to him. I want you to study these videos and really watch how he's moving. Because I'm sure a lot of you aren't familiar with this guy. 
Bear in mind, he has one professional loss, uh, and that you know may have been just something a learning that he needed to do. Uh, but he had also only one loss in his amateur, and he had well over 200 amateur bouts before he became a pro. So he is a, he is a total prodigy and a genius, and he will be a household name at one day, I do think. All right, if you like this video, um, you know, hit the like button and uh, subscribe. Hit the little bell for notification and share it with your friends. And you have a great one.